seems to me if you have something to confess, you spit it out now. Brad Pitt is the world's most notorious outlaw. Casey Affleck is the unlikely man trying to bring him down. I'm Richard Roper. Joining me again this week is Robert Wolanski. Welcome back, sir. Thanks. Delighted as always. A lot of movies to get to. Let's get right to it. First up is Deep Breath Here, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. Some hate that title, but I think it captures the tone of the movie. It also tells you exactly what's going to happen so you can concentrate on other things like the beautiful cinematography, the powerful acting, and the psychological case studies. This seems to be Casey Affleck's breakout year. He steals the film here as Robert Ford, a persistent little bug who worships the legendary outlaw Jesse James. It is interesting the many ways you and I overlap and whatnot. You have blue eyes, I have blue eyes. You're five feet eight inches tall, I'm five feet eight inches tall. Hey, you something. <laughs> now, I like Brad Pitt a lot. He's good here, but sometimes almost a bit too intense and mannered as James. He kind of plays him as a split personality. His own men are deathly afraid of him. Why was your brother so agitated? Which? Bob. That's just his way. He's antsy. You going back to sleep now? You got me agitated now, you see? Sam Rockwell does nice work as Charlie Ford, Bob's older brother. As the law closes in, he considers giving Jesse up or even taking him down himself. Well, it seems to me Jesse's riding from man to man, saying goodbye to the gang. So your friendship can put you under the pansies. I'll grind it fine in my mind, Bob. I can't go any further than that right now. Well, you'll come around. I think the last act of this film is the most fascinating as we see how the public reacted to the death of a killer and how they turned on the man who brought him down. More than a century ago, we were already a celebrity-obsessed culture. The assassination of Jesse James is adapted for the screen and directed by Andrew Dominic. He obviously loves the, uh, the kind of languid style of a, a Terrence Malick. As westerns go, this is about as far as you can get from a shoot 'em up like 310 to Yuma. With a running time of 2 hours and 40 minutes, this film probably will test some audiences. But if you love classic and stylish mood westerns such as McCabe and Mrs. Miller and The Long Riders, this is your film. I liked it a lot. You know, I'm really kind of hit or miss on this. I'm reminded, a colleague, in fact, reminded me of the Pauline Kale line. I know what you cut, but I'm not quite sure what you keep. Mm. I'm sitting through a two-hour and 40-minute movie kind of wondering why this bit is in there and why this bit is in there. And I understand that Dominic is trying to build mood and Dominic mm. is trying to create this lush atmosphere into which we can sort of lose ourselves. Right. But at the end of the day, I just kind of got lost in general. It didn't really seem to work the magic on me that it did on you. And I have to say, it's based on a book from which it takes a great deal of the narration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the narration really reminded me of those Dos Equis ads for the world's most interesting man. Because I kept expecting what? him to say, Jesse James is a man who is so interesting oh, that when it on. rains, it is because he is oh, sad. Oh, come on. You know, you were doing so well the first part of that. And then, the, you know, to go into this Dos Equis ad comparison, Robert. Well, so you're saying no. You're saying borderline, but no. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're saying yeah, it's, it's not it's enough not to recommend. It's not really a film to which I, I think, can recommend you know, people. You're saying that Dominic is trying to do these things. I think he's very, very successful at them. Oh, I mean, the performances are, are terrific. The photography is amazing. I think Casey Affleck's a little, yeah. uh, kind of annoying, quite frankly. And he's I supposed to be I, annoying. I know, but That's I, I can't live with that guy. Guess what? Well, he's supposed to be in it. Ah, man, I think you're missing And I'll say this. Here. The only thing worse than a Terrence Malick movie is someone trying to do a Terrence uh, Malick I couldn't, movie. I, could, I, think that, I think that's a cheap shot. And I think that, it is a cheap that, shot. It's a gratuitous <laughs> shot. And by God, I mean And I think this movie is so I love well Terrence done. Malick, and actually, good, but I don't like seeing good. people imitate Terrence Malick because only Malick can do what he does. I think it works very well. Well, good for you. Thank you. Next up, we have Evan Rachel Wood, starring in her second misguided movie in two weeks, if you count across the universe, if you <laughs> dare, and I know Richard does. This one is called King of California, in which she plays Miranda, a sensible, self-sustaining teen whose father, Charlie, is a mildly crazy ex-jazz musician just returned home from the loony bin. Charlie is played by Michael Douglas in full-on capital-A acting mode. Good God, even his bushy beard appears to be vying for a Screen Actors Guild Award. <laughs> Charlie has come to the conclusion that there is ancient gold buried beneath an Applebee's. No, wait, a Petco. No, I think it's actually a Costco. <laughs> Out amidst the suburban sprawl of what used to be lush, rolling hills. It's only six feet down. Only six feet? Maybe seven. It takes two highly motivated individuals, maybe four hours with the right equipment. Are you nuts? My 
Miranda, speaking in narration that never gets old, is at first appalled by her dad's dumb plan. But of course, the indignation turns to frustration, which leads to resignation. And soon enough, she is believing her dad's fairy tales. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, look, I think I see it right there. I see it. Look, yeah, they're upside down. That's why I didn't recognize them at first. Can I help you? I think it's time to go. Really Written and directed by first-timer Mike Cahill, King of California was also produced by Alexander Payne, the big screen poet of the mundane and out of balance, like Sideways and About Schmidt. This wants to be a Payne movie, but it's merely a Payne. It tries so hard to be so off-kilter and sentimental and wacky and aching that it never transcends being more than a hollow concept about a father and daughter lost in the supermarket. You are absolutely spot on here, and sir. And finally. I'm telling you, you know, and Michael Douglas, you know, you go back about, what, seven years ago with Wonder Boys and Traffic, and he was, you know, right there in the zone, and since then, it's been one bad movie after another. Almost all of his movies since then have been awful, and I, and I <laughs> like him so much, but you're so right. I really, it really gets to me when films treat mental illness as this sort of Don Quixote, Man of La Mancha, he's someone of vision Wacky and word. And endearing. And, and, yeah, and it's not, you know, and it's just, it just falls flat every step of the way. Yeah, and I feel sorry for the, uh, for the daughter, played by Evan Rachel Wood. She should not be subjected to the madness, the, literally the madness of this character. It's a terrible film. We shouldn't be subjected to it either. Well, we're saving the viewers. We're saving the viewers, one viewer at a time. Well, later in the show, Sean Penn goes behind the camera in one of my favorite movies of the year. I actually like one, see? Uh -huh. And next, God help us all, Jessica Alba and Dame Cook star in Good Luck Chuck. You look great. I had a good time. Oh, what's that? Oh, um, I travel to Guatemala every year to help some of the poor villagers. So sweet. Oh! Oh, sorry. Oh, oh no! Our next movie is Good Luck Chuck. Now, as you know, there's a scene in this movie where a penguin bites Dane Cook in the crotch. I'd like to find that penguin and buy it a drink. <laughs> this is an unoriginal, dull-witted, juvenile, crude, defensive, idiotic, and pointless romantic comedy that makes no sense. None. Cook plays Chuck. He was cursed by a goth girl when he was 10 years old. It seems that every woman Chuck dates goes on to marry the next man she meets. What the hell are you talking about? You're a lucky charm. You have sex with someone and then they find their true love. Isn't that how it works? Has everybody lost their minds? That's ridiculous. That's absurd. Do you want top or bottom? The gorgeous but marginally talented Jessica Alba plays Cam, the girl of Chuck's dreams. Fess up about this charm. It's quite a scam you got going. No, it's not me. People will believe whatever they want to believe. What makes you think I'll be kissing you, huh? All right. This movie doesn't even follow its own simple-minded logic. Chuck doesn't want to sleep with Cam because that means the next guy she dates she'll marry. So why not just stay with her? Instead, he turns into a creepy jerk who smothers her with flowers and stalks her at work. Why? I don't know. I guess because it's supposed to be funny. Just like Cam's one character trait, and that's that she's a klutz, always running into things, knocking stuff over, breaking bones, falling down. You know, kind of like those comic geniuses, the Three Stooges. Now, Dane Cook, he keeps taking his shirt off, and everyone keeps telling him that he's very charming, and they're laughing at his jokes, and he's so funny, but I kind of missed all that. I hated this movie. You know, I don't get the way they're selling this movie because uh -huh. the plot you've described is not the plot that's evident in the trailer. Really? In the trailer, it makes it look like Jessica Alba is a klutz who has uh -huh. insinuated herself into Dane Cook's life, mm -hmm. and she's harming him at every turn, but he has to overcome her klutziness in order to find her love. That's not what this movie's about. That's it's Citizen Kane weird, compared to the movie I saw. It's this weird sort of mean-spirited movie <laughs> it is, in which it there's is a mean -spirited. lot of it. There's, a, there's that one montage of 16 frames in which yeah, Chuck is having sex with 16 this different women, yeah. all of whom are completely yeah. naked, which I have no problem with that particular part of it, but I don't quite understand what yeah, he's doing Yeah, so we can here. see Dane Cook, you know, with all these women, and, and he's got this kind of weird style of acting that makes, like, Chevy Chase seems sincere. I mean, even when he's trying to be heartfelt, it almost looks like he's not even looking where he's supposed to be. Like, he's almost looking off camera. It's very strange. The funniest thing he's ever done is that overwrought, sincere music video that's currently airing on YouTube, mm. which is the place it really needs to stay. Yeah. And Jessica Alba, what is she doing here? Well, you know, I, I, you know, she's obviously gorgeous, and she seems like there's some good spirit energy there, but I have not seen her yet. 
give a performance in a movie that says to me, movie star. I see her somebody, maybe playing somebody, you know, the girl next door on a sitcom and probably having a long run doing that, but she's lost here completely. You know, they're this airing... Is a, this is a, one, one quick thing, too, Robert. Yeah. You, know, you talk about the mean-spirited tone of this film. There are two different storylines involving obese women that are both just really kind of just mean and crass and uh. ugly. I mean, it's I, I just the whole tone of this movie. I think it's just like borderline hateful. I didn't like it at all. I gotta tell it you. is. It's a bit of a punch yeah. in the head. Yeah. Coming up next, we improve we things die. quickly with Emil yeah. Hirsch and Vince Vaughn. They go into the wild. But first, here's another review from the Balcony Archive, where you can watch 20 years of movie reviews at at the movies TV dot com. Well, I thought that kid was handsome, though, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, he was a handsome guy. There's, yeah. there's got to be merit to that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's always. I mean, everybody in this movie is extremely good looking. I'll give you that. How did you pull it back together after what happened to you? You become someone else. Okay, looking at movies now in theaters. I like the Brave One. Robert didn't. We both enjoyed oh, the Hunting Party. I was one of the few, I guess, who liked <laughs> Across the Universe. Uh, not so much for you. No, in fact, I, I brought you this because there's That's no a, way in hell I'm listening to the soundtrack oh, wow. to Across the Universe. The soundtrack so, uh, to Across the Universe. So there you go. Yeah. I encourage gift giving at any time. It's the least you. I could do. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Well, from one of my favorite books of the last decade comes one of my favorite movies of the year. Mm. Sean Penn's adaptation of John Krakauer's book, Into the Wild. It's about the life and death of an affluent young man named Christopher McCandless. Chris is played here by the revelatory Emil Hirsch, whose performance I wanted to keep on watching. In fact, I wonder if I can actually beg Sean Penn to screen for me his five-hour version of this. Mm. Good thing Hirsch is so good. He has to be great, so we want to accompany him on that fateful trip from the wealthy suburbs of Virginia to college graduation in Atlanta to every nook and cranny up and down the West Coast to finally the Alaskan wilderness where Chris finds what he has been looking for. Ultimate freedom. An extremist. An aesthetic voyager. <clears throat> whose home is the road. What Chris is looking for, we're actually not that sure. Escape, adventure, salvation, absolution. But along the way, he finds the likes of Catherine Keener and the great unknown Brian Durker as fellow travelers in their hippy-dippy RV, and Vince Vaughn as Wayne Westerberg, who puts Chris to work during his travels. Wayne also tries to talk some sense into the kid. Alex, you're a hell of a young guy, a hell of a young guy. But I promise you this. You're a young guy. Can't be juggling blood and fire all the time. Chris also encounters a kindly, lonely old man named Ron. And yes, that is indeed Hal Holbrook mm. in a most welcome return and warm performance. I mean, the core of man's spirit comes from new experiences. And there you are, stubborn old man, sitting on your butt. Ha! I'll show you, sitting on my butt. Come on, old man, come climb it. Penn's been wanting to make this movie for a decade, but he couldn't until Chris's parents signed off. They put their trust in the right man. Always a good and occasionally a great director, Penn has come up with his majestic triumph in this epic and tragic story of one kid trying to exercise his inner Jack London. You know a thing has succeeded when you feel the maker had to make it. And Into the Wild is as passionate and profoundly moving a film as you will see all year. It doesn't try to make a stand or make a statement. It just tells the story with equal parts joy and despair. I gotta say, I wanna see this again. Oh, you really love this film. I did. And, and I liked it a lot. I don't love it. Um, uh, part of my problem here is just um, the, the treatment where it's almost like a near Jesus-like elevation of this character. Everybody is, I mean, he's obviously very charismatic and people do love him and they do, you know, because everybody, almost everybody who runs into him, Robert, they either want to adopt him or marry him or smother him with love. And so it's interesting, but it just got a little bit too much into the hero worship But it's stuff interesting you make that point because you know? in the book, there are sort of questions about this guy's motivations and whether right. or not he was selfish. Yeah. But in the end, Sean Penn clearly chose to go with the sword, uh, the more messianic yes. version of Chris yes. McCandless. Yeah, which which I have a little bit of a problem with, but I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like I'm going negative on this film because I liked it a lot. It is one of the better movies we've seen this year. Right. Sean Penn does a great job. Emil Hirsch, you are right. He's the right actor for this because he is so charismatic and he is so charming. And there's a certain naivete that would want you know women to kind of want to mother him. And uh, you know you can get you can get all that from this performance. You go, okay, I get why this guy charms so many people and really good supporting work. Vince Vaughn, it's nice to see him play kind of a, a you know a straight dramatic type role. Hal Holbrook is great. You're absolutely right about all of that. 
You know, as I was watching the movie, I just kept feeling more and more moved by it. There was just oh. something that sort of overwhelmed me. And maybe it was Eddie Vedder's songs, because Eddie songs Vedder did the great. score, and they're astounding. Yeah. And I'm not a huge Pearl Jam fan, but there's something about Eddie Vedder's sort of barren and husky voice yeah. over this movie yeah. that really this is, makes this it. This is a classic example. I mean, it's obviously not a musical, but the music becomes a real character, a real driving force, and, and, and perfectly done. So it's certainly something that people should check out, unlike our next movie. <laughs> okay, I want you to imagine the pitch meeting where someone said five words, Snow White goes to college. <laughs> then imagine someone actually giving a green light to this really bad idea. Presto, it's Sidney White, one of the dopiest, goofiest, and yes, I guess you could say sneeziest and sleepiest movies of the year. Now with her weird cartoonish voice and her school of Nickelodeon delivery, Amanda Bynes is something less than a movie star. She hammers home every line and I roll as incoming freshman Sidney White. Get it? I'm sorry. I kind of tend to overtalk when I'm nervous. It's a disease. One without a cure, so stop me anytime, please. You're nervous? Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's not you. Tyler, was it? No, it's because of the whole rush. You know, the very term rush is an amp upper. It amps up the old nerves. <laughs> I have to go. The cute but alarmingly thin Sarah Paxton plays Rachel. She's the wicked witch. I mean the evil sorority queen who takes an instant dislike to Sydney. Hi, Sydney. It's nice to see you found some people you fit in with. Mm, it is nice, isn't it? If only there were a place where superficial, materialistic could fit in. Oh, wait, there is. There. Whatever. It can be fun when we get a postmodern update on Could the Brothers Grimm or Shakespeare or something like that. that. It can also be deadly if there's no imagination to the update, no compelling no, reason to remake like the that. story as a college that. romance. I I'm sure Amanda Bynes is a nice young lady. I know she has her fans, but she'll have to improve to become the Sandra D of her time. I just don't understand why this isn't being rebuilt as Revenge of the Nerds. Because well, it, that's the move. Yeah, it uh, literally yeah. steals the last ten minutes from *Revenge of the Nerds*. But instead yeah. of saying "I am a nerd," they say "I am a dork." You're right. The "I am a nerd" speech has been completely it's lifted. It's literally so, yeah, lifted. I am a dork speech. I mean, I, I fully expect a lawsuit following the release of this movie. If not from <laughs> us, then certainly from the makers of *Revenge of the Nerds*. And let me just say it right now: if it hasn't been said before, Amanda Bynes is no Robert Carradine. You're right. <laughs> Just uh, trying to throw that out. Coming up next, one of the funniest movies of the year is now in the <laughs> with some hilarious extras in our video segment. This is fun. But first, let's take a look at what's coming up on next week's show. You've been playing kid your entire life, and I just joined the dad team. Do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? My boss hates you. It's a trick. It's not that the other players know when you've got something good. All right, looking at movies new on DVD, I liked Lucky You. Two movies I hated... Bug and Severance, do not waste your money. However, we have the two-disc release of one of my favorite comedies in recent years, Knocked Up. And the cool thing, Robert, you know, the second disc with all the extras, Judd Apatow put a lot, a lot of effort into the extras, and they're worthy of the film. In fact, there's this one hilarious 30-minute piece where we learn that some other actors were actually up for the role that went to Seth Rogen. Hey, can anyone find, who's directing this movie? Does anyone know? You know what, Mike? Why don't you direct yourself then? Why don't you do that? I would love to do that. Why don't you do it? That would be heavenly. It just... And it was at that moment that I realized I probably would have to recast the part. Most of the time, even with some of my favorite movies, I really don't need to slog through all the extras. But in this case, i got to tell you, there's three hours of material, and it's almost all great stuff. I'm not going to lie. It's sitting at my house waiting for me, and I don't want to crack it open because I just don't want to get to it just yet. Yeah, it's like the anticipation it. of it. Yeah, it's my favorite movie of the year, and I can't wait to see the extras. It's terrific. But, you know, my video pick is as under the radar as yours is the summer's comedic jumbo jet. <laughs> it's called A Lawyer Walks Into a Bar, and it's Eric Chaikin's Film Fest favorite years. documentary it's that serves to both defend and prosecute the legal profession. Chaikin focuses his camera on folks for whom there are two categories, them who passed the bar and those who flunked it. And uh, I've taken the bar exam in California 41 times. You know, I'd feel bad for them if only they weren't, uh, you know, lawyers. Something about our society where people seem to have more disdain for lawyers than, like, serial killers. I, I know, know, they're, they're fine so tell you. Sounds interesting, though. I'm going to check it out. So Lawyer Walks Into a Bar is available now. Knocked Up will be in stores on Tuesday. We'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The movie tickets card available only at movietickets.com. Guests of Ebert and Roper stay at the Peninsula Chicago, the city's most exciting luxury hotel located in the heart of Chicago's Magnificent Mile. 
All right, recapping the movies on this week's show. Neither of us like The King of California. Good luck, Chuck or Sidney White. I think that's putting it mildly. <laughs> we split on the assassination of Jesse James. I liked it a little more than Robert. We both liked Into the Wild. In fact, I would say that you loved that film. I did love that. You loved Assassination of Jesse James. And I want to be very clear, I kind of like Jesse James. I just wish it had been shorter. And also, I think only Terrence Malick can do Terrence Malick. That's all I'm saying. That's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed. The doctor will see you now. It's fruit crepe fever. Sweet cream cheese, luscious fruit, and delectable crepes. Only at IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. We know your dirty little secret. Your mop. Get to know the cleaner way to clean with the Libman Wonder Mop. The mop head is machine washable. Only from Libman. Net Zero gives you the fastest surfing available over dial-up and virus protection starting at $9.95. Try it risk-free for 30 days with our money-back guarantee. More people are starting their day with Plum Smart from SunSweet. I'm starting. Plum Smart has fiber and nutrients to help keep your digestive system healthy and in balance. Start smart with Plum Smart.